morning. My name is John Quam, and I'm the director of the National Teacher of the Year program. And I'd like to welcome you to this public release of the results of the survey done of Teachers of the Year, subtitled Good to Great. Good to Great. <laughs> and uh, thank you very much for taking the time. The Teachers of the Year are in Washington this week to be honored by the President, amongst other things. The National Teacher of the Year 2014 was announced a few minutes ago, who is from the state of Maryland, Sean McComb. And enjoy your morning. And I now turn it over to Ellen Skerritt from AIR, Great. the Thanks. principal researcher on the project. Thank you. Hi, good morning. I'm Ellen Sherritt from the Center on Great Teachers and Leaders at American Institutes for Research. And I'm so glad to have the honor to be able to open up today's very exciting panel on a report from Good to Great, Exemplary Teachers Share Perspectives on Increasing Teacher Effectiveness Across the Career Continuum. I'd first like to thank John Quam and CCSSO for generously hosting today's event and also give a very big shout out to Katherine Bassett, CEO of the National Network of State Teachers of the Year, and Story, for initiating this entire project. It really is remarkable to think that a group of excellent teachers convinced six major national organizations to join forces to conduct this study. And it says a lot about how much respect all of us have for Katherine as an individual as well as NSTOI as an organization. I'd also like to thank the other partners who are part of this project. Can you actually stand up if you're here from one of the organizations that participated so we can acknowledge you? Okay. <laughs> so the partners included the National Council on Teacher Quality, National Education uh, um, Association, and the American Association for Colleges of Teacher Education and the Council for the Accreditation of Educator Preparation. And this was a true partnership in every sense of the word. Catherine brought us all together a year ago next week to initially brainstorm what the study would look like and then again um, in December to analyze the survey results. And in between, each of these partners were really instrumental in developing content, reviewing the survey instrument, and reviewing the final report. So thank you. I personally have been itching to conduct a study with teachers for quite a while. Back in 2009, a group of us at American Institutes for Research conducted, conducted a study in Chicago on teachers' perspectives on educational research so that we could determine if there's ways that we could improve what we're doing or whether the research that we're producing is helpful at all to the field. And we did find that um, teachers really like educational research and in fact that, that they were itching to participate in a research study um, from start to finish. And so when Catherine approached us to partner on this initiative, I of course was more than excited to, to um, get to do that. Incidentally, our 2009 study of teachers' use of educational research also found that while teachers are positively disposed towards research, they oftentimes don't access research as much as they would like, in large part due to the constraints on their time, which we know are many, but also because apparently teachers find research and us researchers to be a little bit boring, <laughs> pretentious, um, esoteric, out of touch, uh, long-winded and full of caveats and qualifications. Um, so I promise to try not to be any of those things um, while highlighting the findings from our report today. But with maybe just one caveat, that, um, because I'd like to just briefly share a potentially long-winded, boring, pretentious um, tidbit about where this study is situated within the wider national backdrop of educational policy research. So a decade ago, in, 2013, in 2003, 
Russ Whitehurst, who many of you know was the director of the Institute for Education Sciences at the U.S. Department of Education for many years, delivered a speech at the American Educational Research Association where he um, implored the research community to start moving beyond some of the um, ludicrously uh, focused studies that he saw in the program. He saw one that was called episodes of theory building as a transformative and decolonizing process, a microethnographic inquiry into deeper awareness of embodied knowing. And so he asked the educational research community to instead move towards creating research that was relevant, accessible, and that would actually lead to improving our schools. And so given what we know about how teachers are the single most important factor affecting student achievement at the school level, what could be more relevant than doing research on effective teachers and doing so by asking effective teachers their perspectives on that question? Fast forwarding um, to 10 years to just a few weeks ago, a uh, bipartisan bill emerged from the U.S. Uh, House of Representatives that would significantly increase teacher voice in setting the national research, educational research agenda, including having teachers reviewing a lot of the research studies that are, are being produced, and also um, placing two educators on the Institute of Education Board of Advisors. So our study by being initiated by teachers themselves and including teachers in the process of conducting it um, from start to beginning, as, from start to end, as well as including several dozen teachers at critical junctures in the study process, we believe um, um, is an important piece of advancing how research is conducted, both in terms of the design and findings from our report. So what did we find? Well, what we did was surveyed over 300 state and national teachers of the year who earned their recognition between the mid-1970s and 2013. We asked them about 163 different supports and experiences that they might have had over the course of their career from the pre-service stage to the novice stage to the career stage and then even um, as teacher leaders, the types of supports and experiences that help them grow to be more effective with their students. First, we asked if they had each experience. If they did, we then asked whether that experience was important to improving their effectiveness on a scale to one to five. And for those experiences that they said were important, since they were many, we asked them to rank them um, so that we could find out what their top three most important experiences were um, for various categories. And we found three things. First, we had a number of findings that echoed what existing research already tells us matters to teachers. Second, we had some new findings that warranted more research and more dialogue. And third, we had a key finding related to teacher leadership. So in terms of the findings that confirm what prior research has told us. We found that at the pre-service stage, it was seen as highly critical to have a high quality clinical experience or student teaching. It was also really key to have um, the content in their content coursework. At the novice stage, what emerged as most critical was having access to a mentor, a strong school principal, and assignments that were aligned well with the teacher's area of certification. That the thing is really critical to have um, a collaborative school culture with common planning time with other teachers and opportunities for reflection. And what surprised us, the key one was about the role of ongoing formal education. So we hear a lot these days about the fact that a master's degree has no effect at all on uh, teacher effectiveness. But what we actually found in our study was that the state and national teachers of the year who, who responded um, said they, they many of them, nine, over 90%, did in fact engage in ongoing formal education. It wasn't necessarily a master's, it could have been a doctorate, could have been a um, just ongoing coursework not leading to a degree. But nearly 50% of them said that that was in fact 
uh, one of the three most important professional supports that they had during the career stage, making it, in fact, one of the, one of the highest ranking supports. Um, so there's many reasons for the dichotomy between what we found and what other research has suggested. But what we have taken from this is that a more nuanced dialogue is needed around what makes a master's degree effective or not and um, um, how individuals can actually make the most of these courses if they do attend them. Um, then the finding, oh sorry, I meant to also say that we had a few findings that warranted more research in that um, they were seen as highly valuable by those who experienced them, but they weren't very widespread. So national board certification and having a clinical experience that lasted a full year were seen as among the most important experiences for those who did have them, but only a small minority of the state and national teachers of the year did in fact have those experiences. So the, the key finding was about the role of teacher leaders. When we asked the stories about their important experiences at the pre-service stage, they told us that um, among the most important was having an effective cooperating teacher and also having their classes be taught by professors who had recent K-12 uh, teaching experience. At the novice stage, as I mentioned, having access to a mentor was seen as the most important support. And at the career stage, to a lesser extent, but still important, was having professional development that was delivered by individuals who had recent K-12 teaching experience. Then, I asked them what types of experiences helped them to continue to grow once they actually became teacher leaders and were recognized as a teacher of the year it was precisely delivering those supports that they said were most important to them. So being a coach, being a mentor, teaching if they had the chance to do so at the pre-service level, and delivering professional development to their peers. I know Derek's gonna elaborate a little bit more on that important finding. So we see this study not so much as a definitive guide as to where we should invest our resources and where we should cut our resources, but rather as a guide to spark more conversations in particular districts and states, contexts, about what supports need to be in place to help every teacher go from good to great. So to do that, we developed a companion discussion starter tool that goes along with the report. So we have this here, it's on our website, which is www.gtlcenter.org. And it basically takes users through each of the findings. You can, you can click here, or you can use the arrows at the bottom. And for each one, it provides an overview of the findings from the report, but then also some probing questions for teachers, policymakers at the school, district, and state level, and higher education institutions to jointly discuss how these findings apply in their own schools and districts and programs. So we encourage you to check out and use this discussion starter tool as you're reading the report. And on that topic of the importance of promoting discussion around this report, I will now turn it over to Catherine Bassett to lead what is sure to be an exciting panel discussion about this. Thank you, Thank you so much, Ellen. I'm just going to stay seated. I have the privilege of facilitating a terrific discussion with an amazing group of people who care deeply about education, and I'd like to introduce them to you this morning. Before I do that, however, I'd like to ask all of the 2014 State Teachers of the Year to stand up so that our Washington community can see who you are and applaud your efforts. Thank you. I'm going to start um, with Angela Minichi. Angela is the director of the Center for Great Teachers and Leaders at AIR. And in that role, Angela, has a tremendous amount of responsibility in terms of directing the research agenda for the center. Angela is an educator. She is a researcher. 
And she is someone who cares deeply about education, about teaching, and about learning. She was the perfect partner for this project. When we talk about teaching, we often talk about the need for collaboration, and we talk about the fact that we don't have the opportunities to collaborate frequently enough in our classrooms and in our schools, primarily because we're bound by the bus schedule. <laughs> in this project, we were able to collaborate with awesome, awesome partners. And as Ellen pointed out, a group of teachers brought these seven organizations together. And Stoy has done over the past 18 months, it is that of which I am most proud. We knew we needed a science partner, and we went to AIR. It was our first attempt at getting that science partner. They took us very seriously. They called a meeting, Angela led that meeting, and they invested time, energy, funding in this project. I am honored to introduce you to Angela Minici. And Angela, I would like to start with you. So the, the GTL Center at AIR agreed to partner with Enstoy and our five other partners on this project as the science partner. Why do you feel that it's important to study and report findings on the issue of teacher effectiveness through the lens of effective teachers. And what would you like to see happen next in terms of this work? Well, thanks, Catherine. Um, and thank you for that uh, very uh, generous and wonderful introduction. Uh, and I would just like to echo that. It has been a, a pleasure to work with you and the other partners as well. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, I just want to say it's, it's, it's so great to have this opportunity to talk to you today, especially during uh, this event. So thank you uh, for having us here and being able to talk to you about some of the work that we've done. Um, so Catherine asked, why did we want to do this work and why was it important? And for those of you who aren't familiar with the Center on Great Teachers and Leaders, one of, the, the, one of our charges at the Center is really to support states in their efforts to support educators, um, helping uh, recruit, retain, develop, support educators in their states. And so one of the things that's really missing from the conversation and has been missing for quite a bit is this idea about how do teachers go from novice to expert? What do we know about teacher development? And we don't have enough research and there's not enough uh, ideas out there about that and, it, and it's really kind of a key critical issue. So one reason why this report begins to start to get into that space and answer that question um, is because we were able to, to look at teachers who already identified as exemplary teachers and say, what, what was necessary and what was important to you, for your development? And so I think that's one reason that we really wanted to be in that space was to start to answer that really important question because it's difficult to know what kinds of supports to advocate for teachers when we're not really sure? How do, how do teachers go from novice to expert? Do all teachers need the same kinds of supports? Um, what does that look like at, at both the state, the district, and school level? So I think it's, that's a really important question for us as, as in this profession to be answering. And it was a, it was a pleasure to um, kind of get into that space with, uh, with this study. I think the second reason that this was really important is because we really wanted to uh, make sure that um, another missing element from the conversation was uh, making sure that we were really tapping the knowledge and expertise of teachers. Um, so not only just studying about how do we support teachers in the profession, but learning from teachers about what supports have been really essential um, to them as well. So that opportunity to answer the question about um, how do all teachers develop, um, or to begin to answer that question and to hear directly from teachers themselves I think was uh, was really important for us and it was a very compelling reason um, to want to partner with other organizations that are in that space. And, and I think that's the other thing I want to mention about the partnership is there are a lot of organizations who um, are in the space of educator quality and we do care about supporting educators. So opportunities for us to kind of coalesce around a topic like this um, to help us leverage resources and expertise and knowledge I think is really critical um, in supporting the profession. 
Um, and then finally, you know, where would we want to go next with this? I think this just is, um, it's exciting. It's a, it's a starting point for us. And I think we want to continue to answer this overarching question about how do we support people in the profession. Um, and I could see us looking at other, um, starting to look at other teachers who are um, uh, been identified as effective or have had ex effective experiences, such as like what Ellen had mentioned this morning, like nationally board certified teachers or other teachers um, in that particular space. So I'm hoping that this is the start of this work for us and that we can continue to work with great partners like we've been doing um, to answer this really important question. So thank you. Thank you, Angela. I'm going to turn next to Derek Olson. Derek is the Minnesota State Teacher of the Year 2009. Derek, yay, Megan. <laughs> Derek served on this project as one of two teacher researchers. In every research project that NSTOI engages in, we have teacher researchers on the project working side by side with scientists. On this project, we had Philip Bigler, who was both a Virginia and a National Teacher of the Year, and Derek Olson working as teacher researchers. And they worked with Ellen and Angela and their team at AIR. They worked with our partners. And they were engaged every step of the way. Derek is also pursuing his own advanced degree, his PhD. And I forget in what, Derek. I apologize. Oh, well, for the opportunity for an advertisement. I also will be surveying STOIs sometime this summer mm -hmm. um, on their opinion on the important characteristics of teacher evaluation. Right. Thank you. And so this was an awesome experience for Derek to be able to work with scientists, but it was also an awesome experience for scientists to work with Derek. Because from Derek, they learned what is actually happening on the ground, in the classroom, in the schools, in education policy. And he was able to inform their work just as they informed his. Derek, as a teacher researcher on this project, you were very, very close to this work, almost from the very beginning of it. What is the key takeaway that you, for you, from all of the report findings? Well, I'll get to key takeaways in just a sec. First of all, thank you for that very, very kind um, introduction. And it really was a tremendous experience for me, both as a teacher of the year and as a developing researcher. And for those of you who are currently starting this toy journey, I, I, you, you, will have, you are all teacher leaders. And you will have so many new opportunities to, to leverage this new um, aspect to, to who you are. And you'll have many different paths. You'll have an opportunity to walk down. And you won't be able to walk down them all. And I hope some of you choose the, um, the path of research. It's not the most glamorous, but it is really important. And, and research needs the perspective of people that are in the trenches right now. So do the boardroom, so do boardrooms, so do, so do the Capitol Hills, so do the, so do the policymakers. But, but research does too, and, and I think it's a very, very, very important way that we can contribute and continue to grow into being even better teachers ourselves. So I'd encourage you to consider that, especially if Catherine Bassett asks. Well, for that matter, if Cass Catherine Bassett asks you to do anything, <laughs> just do, do it. it. <laughs> <laughs> My husband says I'm relentless. I prefer to think that I'm charmingly, um, I don't know what, <laughs> persistent, charmingly persistent. Well, I, I actually, I think that, that that does speak to something. I was going to mention that's already been mentioned, and that is it was amazing for me to see six or seven organizations that, that are all involved with education but have very different missions and goals come together for one piece of research that I think that lends incredible weight to the power of this and it also would not have happened without the what does your husband call it again relentlessness the relentlessness <coughs> and the um, of, of Catherine yes, and her words. passion around around this sort of thing um, I believe the power of this research lies in, the, in that it gives a collective and quantitative voice to the perspectives of exemplary practitioners in the classroom on factors that supported them in getting to that point of being exemplary. And that's so, so, so important. Um, I'm passionate about that. I want to make sure to continue my own work. I'll be in trying to get to story voices out there on another completely different topic, that of teacher evaluation. Um, but moving on to the key finding, there are many, many important findings from this research. But I think there's one theme that several of those key fi findings fall under that's very important. And that is that teacher involvement is very, very important to the development of teachers. And that teachers of quality can be a big part of the solution 
to raising up teacher quality across the nation. Um, and this comes across in findings in four different areas that um, Ellen briefly mentioned that I'd like to um, um, elaborate on. Mentoring, course instruction, collaboration, and our clinical experiences. And I'll start with mentoring. It's not surprising that novice teachers found that of the supports that helped them most in those first couple years of teaching, um, having a strong mentor, be it an official mentor or an unofficial mentor, was crucial. That doesn't surprise anyone. There's other research out there that supports it. The, the challenge is it's just sometimes hard to fund it. Um, what was a bit more surprising was that teacher leaders, when asked what helps them be, go from being good to great as a teacher, one of the things that was most important was them as teacher leaders being mentors, being coaches, being in, um, instructional facilitators, that that helped them become a better classroom practitioner themselves. Um, and I think that's really important because it, it demonstrates a very, very um, s a sense of efficient synergy where everybody's, um, everybody's growing. It's a double bang for the buck. And when you think about policymakers who need to make, these deci make the decisions on how money is spent in education, we need to speak policymakers' language. And the policymakers' language isn't necessarily about, it's not that emotional piece. It's more about what, what's efficient, w where can we get the best value for our dollars, um, and, um, and that sort of thing. And so when we have something like, for instance, mentoring, which doesn't just help our beginning teachers get good, but helps our good teachers get great, according to them, that that's where they're finding their value and becoming even better, then that's an excellent place to invest because it's, it's a double investment in essence. Um, I'd just like to give an anecdote from my own experience as a teacher. I've been teaching for 24 years. 24 years ago, I had a mentor, too, actually. My first year, a woman by the name of Margaret Ornberg. It was her last year teaching, and I think she was bound and determined to cram 30 years of teaching wisdom in, in, into me and so that I could carry it on. She called me her little Norwegian. Um, I'm from Minnesota, remember. And, and I learned so much from Margaret that still sticks with me to this day. She retired. And then I was in a building with four, uh, six sixth grades, and it was an intermediate building. And we had one woman who was about five years away from retirement by the name of Nelda Gustafsson, another good Norwegian Minnesota name. And she took five new sixth grade teachers under her wing, and for the next five years developed us from novice to career stage teachers. We called her fondly the rock. We could go to her with anything. We felt comfortable, we felt supported, we felt secure, we felt encouraged. And I think it's interesting that now, 24 years later, all six of us are still involved in education as teacher, teacher leaders in one way or another. And when you look at all the other research out there that talks about how so many of our potentially excellent teachers leave in two years because they didn't, and why? Because they didn't feel supported. It even goes more to show that our findings in this study are, are crucially important, that novice teachers need mentoring, and teacher leaders become even better teacher leaders by being mentors or coaches. The second thing is course instruction. Um, for those in their pre-service stage, one of the things that they talked about was that it was very, very important that they have courses taught by instructors who had current or recent classroom instruction, a classroom experience. Um, that's not surprising. We've probably all heard that before. But what was interesting is that our teacher leaders said that one of the things that helps them grow, have, has helped them grow to continue to go from good to great is when they are involved themselves in teaching professional development or course instruction. And this is really important. Again, it's a, it's a synergy of efficiency, and it's a crucial at a time when there's a heightened focus on what's happening in our um, teacher preparation institutions across the country to understand how important it is to get teachers into those ro roles, in, um, whether it be an adjunct, adjunct, an adjunct fashion or something else is very, very important. Um, Anecdotally speaking, last year was the first time I taught a graduate course. I was asked by the University of Wisconsin River Falls to teach a graduate course in social studies elementary methods. And um, I'm happy that the evaluations of my students said that I did a good job of being relevant and practical and informative. But I can tell you more importantly that I am a much better sixth grade social studies teacher this year for having taught that course last year. So that, that, that experience I had was an energizing, revitalizing opportunity for me to become significantly better 
and move that much closer from good to great as a teacher. And Derek, I'm going to, um, these are great points and so important, and I think that the anecdotes really bring them to life, particularly for those of us um, who may not be in the classroom, and I appreciate them greatly. We're going to move on That's now fine. because we're, we have 2014 State Teachers of the Year who have to get on a bus. So we're being For a very to, exciting day at the yes, Department of Education, right? Uh, yes. And I live in fear yes. of John Quam, and if they're not on that bus, um, <laughs> it's just not going to be a good thing. I'm going to move now to Chris Minnick. When you're starting a brand new organization, and you're like not even small, or not even tiny, you're teeny tiny, and started, if you don't have great friends in the community, it's almost impossible to get off the ground. And Chris Minnick and Stoy has a great friend. Chris is someone who has devoted his life to not just education policy, but to education. He understands teaching. He understands the issues that we face on a daily basis as teachers. And he doesn't just understand them, he cares about them. He cares about our students. He has been an enormous source of strength for me and support for our organization. And I'm thrilled that he's agreed to take time out of what is an insane schedule to be with us this morning. So Chris, CCSSO is engaged in a very important study right now, the NTEP project, which is looking at not only how we prepare teachers now, but how might we more effectively prepare teachers in the future. How will the findings from this study help to inform that important work? And is there anything that we did not ask that you would like us to dig into more deeply if we are able to move forward? Great. And, um Good morning. I'll be brief. Uh, good to see you all again. Um, you're probably tired of hearing from me, but I'll keep talking to you this week. So, um, the uh, uh, first thing is, I have uh, uh, many of you have followed me on Twitter, and I've followed you back. So I'm seeing what's going on this week with you, and it is a lot of fun to watch. So please keep getting your voices out. That's the broken record that I'm going to keep talking to you about. Is that. Um, uh, it's so rare for people in D.C. to talk to actual teachers. And uh, you probably have seen this already, how excited people are to see you. And just please continue to get your voices out uh, around these conversations. Today's an important conversation as well with the Department of Education. They need to hear from you. Second thing is, uh, I've never been around a room with so many children in it and so th th that are so well behaved. I have a two-year-old, and he would be bouncing off the walls in this room. So um, I don't know what you all do with your children, but I need, a, I need, a, I need some advice on that if, uh, if you brought them in here. But, um, so I want to talk just for a second about what we're doing on preparation. I, uh, I, I think a lot of the findings in this study confirm the direction we're taking. It's also challenged me to think a little differently in a couple areas. I'll talk about one of those areas here in a second. So, so first, um, I want to make sure I, uh, all of you know Janice Poda, but she's leading this work for us around uh, teacher preparation. Janice, could you wave so everybody knows? Yeah, right. Um, Janice was in a State Department, uh, South Carolina State Department, before coming uh, to work with us, and she's doing an excellent job of, of keeping the states moving in a good direction in terms of, A, getting the bureaucracy out of teachers' way. I mean, this is an easy applause line, but really, it shouldn't be hard to get recertified if you have an excellent track record of, of what you're doing. So we need to make that process easier. We also need to make it more difficult to become a teacher. And what I mean by that is we got to set a bar for getting into the classroom. Um, that includes sort of alternate certification routes. And there should be a situation where teachers are required to show their performance before they're fully certified in states. That, uh, that we know that, that the student uh, data is part of this conversation. It's not the only thing. But there should be a conversation about what's going on there. So there's some things that we're doing with states to try to make it, again, easier for teachers uh, in the long run, 
but also that there is a real bar to entry into this profession because it is a profession. It shouldn't be easy to become a teacher. It should be hard. And we should expect a lot out of our teachers, which we do. And you are the best of the best. And those are the types of things we want out of every teacher we have in, in, in our country. So the second thing that we're looking at is, um, so state education departments or um, somebody in the state government approves the program approval of each of these programs that uh, certifies teachers and trains them. And for, for a long time, it's largely been a situation where states are just approving these programs based on uh, a visit, and it's usually not quite as often. States have uh, been reticent to close programs that aren't doing well with teachers. And so, and I think that's unfair to a teacher that's going through four years, sometimes six years of education, and then, um, uh, then is at the end of the situation figures out they're not quite ready to go into the classroom. So we have to, we have to shine a light on those programs. There's very good programs out there, uh, and we should be elevating their status. But we also have to make sure that we have a situation where um, programs that aren't getting it done with candidates aren't allowed to function anymore. Because quite frankly, every state that I talk to has too many elementary school teachers coming out of their ed programs. So why, why do we allow that to keep happening? I mean, we just do. So, so there's, there's lots of things that we can work on here. And it's about elevating the profession. If we start acting and policy starts reflecting, how important this job is in this country, then we can change the dialogue about what it means to be a teacher. And then you guys are going to be a part of that. So I'm excited about that part. Um, the last thing I'll just say really quickly, and thank you for, um, for listening, the, the master's degree finding in here is an interesting one for me because um, I talk to lots of teachers, especially friends of mine, who say they went through their master's degree program because they could get a raise. And... Um, I don't think anybody should be forced through further education uh, to get a raise. However, it's obvious from these findings that many of the state teachers of the year found this to be really good development for them. So how do we marry those two conversations? I don't think there should be a barrier to raises for teachers based on continuing education, but also um, when the master's degree is helpful to a teacher, we should encourage that. So those are things that I'm struggling with uh, as, I, as I read the report, and I'd, I'd like to talk more about. So thanks, Catherine, for your Thank time. You, I really Chris. appreciate your support, your kind introduction, and this is a great organization. I'm, I'm happy to support oh, it. So. Thank, Thank you, Chris. Mary, I'd like to turn to you now. Mary Delworth has been engaged in educational research for a long time, and most of her work has focused at the teacher leader level. A lot of Mary's work has been done at the National Board for Professional Teaching Standards, and she's also been doing a lot of research most recently into diversifying the teaching force. Mary, what did the findings in this report, with teachers looking at their own growth across career continuum stages teach us about how teachers best grow and develop in practice? Um, that's, that's a good question. It's a very difficult question to answer given that um, the respondent group, uh, by and large as I understand it, are me, baby boomers or Gen X. Okay, And what we're talking about nowadays is the group that's coming in the cohort, it's Gen Y. It's the millennials. And so when I was reading the report, I was trying to say, okay, what things come together? Mm -hmm. And actually three things did. Um, the, the factors that I think are very important for all groups. One would be practice, one would be collaboration, and the other one would be independence. Um, mm -hmm. the, the notion that t teachers at all levels want to um, practice, practice, Comes, comes out to me. They may need or desire um, a certain amount of practice at certain stages, but nevertheless, it was surprising to me that the, the individuals that were at the teacher leader level, the penultimate, still wanted to practice. Okay, I think that's a very, very important um, thing for us to, to take note of. The, um, we, I think we should keep in mind that the current cohort of teachers have not had an opportunity like the, the, the former um, cohorts of teachers to practice as much. 
because of this onset of alternative routes, which ab abbreviates instruction and abbreviates experience. So they haven't had the opportunity to actually have as much right. as others have. I think that um, it'll be challenging to um, well-informed educators, to um, thoughtful economists, and um, kind policy makers to come up with some designs, models and designs that will allow practice to continue on and on and on within um, your work. The um, the second thing is that came to mind for me was the notion of collaboration, or if you will, um, isolate versus isolation. It's clear to me that, um, again, the respondent group are not ones who, we were not ones who were raised and learned how to appreciate Facebook and Twitter and share absolutely everything we do on a regular basis. <laughs> but the current cohort is inclined to do that, okay? At all of the uh, teachers at all levels still want to communicate. They don't want to be isolated in their own classrooms. They want to be visible. They want to have an opportunity to exchange conversation and thoughts with each other. Now, again, there may be some generational differences because from what we understand of Generation Y, or the millennials, they want feedback on themselves, and they want it right away, okay? And and sometimes, and they, they, they do, <laughs> they do, and that's okay, okay. Uh, <laughs> the, those those of other cohorts want to collaborate with each other to solve problems. There's a there's a minor difference for me in that. Nevertheless, they still want to discuss with each other. They still want and appreciate a learning community. Okay, and I think that that's very, very important. The um, last but not least in terms of my observation is the notion of independence. Mm -hmm. That when individuals at any stages are given responsibility and they are given independence and some a reasonable authority to be able to do what it is that they, they believe they can do as professionals, they flourish and they do better. And so in this report, we see where teacher leaders and others, I mean, and career level, I believe, I believe I'm right on that, are those that say, let me pick out my professional development. Don't let the district pick it out. I'm an intelligent educator. I know what's best for me, and I can pick it out. It's a level of independence. The other thing is the, um, the notion that you have been, you're independent and you've been given responsibility to be able to develop programs and implement them um, puts a great deal of um, pressure on you, but also puts expectate, it gives you great, uh, there's great expectation for you, so you rise to the occasion. Um, the, um, and I think that that's very important in terms of becoming, coming from good to great. The, um, one of the things I, I have to say in closing is that when I was looking at these different categories of teacher stage, uh, there are, I looked, my, my immediate sense was these are not the stages now or uh, they won't, soon they won't be the stages. There's nothing that suggests and there's conversations that indicate that uh, new teachers, novice teachers, can take on teacher leadership roles. And that there are things, so for instance, in technology, in a, at a school level, in a school building, they, there's nothing that would prohibit them, I don't believe, in taking on leadership roles in working with their colleagues and peers on, on some of those issues, for instance. So that, um, the again, teacher leader is something that's going completely around. Also, if we talk about generations, um, the notion that there is a career level teacher is something that's beginning to, to um, go away because the current cohort of teachers, as we understand them, Gen Y millennials, do not and according to the uh, most recent report from the Carnegie Foundation for the Investment in Teaching, they do not intend on staying in the classroom for the course of, the, of, of their working lives. 
and that's something that really we really need to consider in terms of role differentiation within schools. In other words, let's, that we're challenged to find things that will keep them in the schools. And, uh, and I should hasten to add that this is not something that's just necessarily, um, it, it's not exclusive to teachers. It's, ex it's something that's general for that generation. And so I really appreciated the, um, the reading the report, Catherine. And I love listening to, to Mary. She is, I think, a teacher's researcher. She oh, brings it right back to the classroom. And those were excellent points. Thank, thank you. you so much, Mary. Dave, I'm going to turn to you um, to kind of close things out for the panel before we go to questions. Dave Basso is the Connecticut State Teacher of the Year 2012. He has just finished successfully defending his dissertation. And oh, in two weeks, I apologize. I thought he had, had defended. He's finished, but in two weeks, he will successfully defend his dissertation. I have every confidence. And I think that the teachers in the room and, and the policy folks in the room will be interested in the topic of David's work. So David, in what ways are the findings of this study supported by the qualitative findings of your own research? And how might teacher morale, motivation, and professional identity be positively affected by enhanced roles for teacher leadership? Thank you so much, Catherine. And uh, I'm thrilled for everybody to be having this experience, uh, and I'm living vicariously uh, through you this week um, and going forward. Uh, a couple weeks ago, I was watching a, an ESPN episode about Archie Manning and the Manning family. Some of you may have seen that. And when he got drafted, he went to a team that wasn't great. And towards the end, they talked about, well, what if he had gone to this great team? Uh, would he have been able to develop even more so? And, and I thought that that was an interesting analogy uh, for many teachers who are potentially are going to be very effective and exemplary, uh, but maybe the, the teaching training or the uh, lack of mentoring or a school culture or school leadership uh, may have been a hindrance in the development of that effectiveness. And as I thought about the research I did, uh, and I, I looked at what this report, uh, the evidence from the report and the findings of the report, and there was a lot of overlap. Uh, if I can just briefly quickly summar summarize the, the research that I did, uh, I interviewed 24 of my fellow 2012 Teachers of the Year. Uh, and so about an hour interview, and I asked a question about why, you, why did you get into teaching? And it was bookended at the end by a question, how do you want to be remembered uh, when you retire? And in between were a lot of questions about policy and. Uh, school leadership and, and classroom management and things like that. And so there are six main findings. Uh, one was, and I think everyone in the room can appreciate it, is that teachers are drawn to the vocational service aspect of teaching and it's an emotional uh, career, and it's an emotional work, uh, and, and there's many non-cognitive aspects to it. Uh, another theme was about the external perceptions of the profession and how it affects motivation and morale. Uh, the third theme was about school leadership and school culture. The fourth theme was related to professional development. Uh, the fifth theme was related to self-efficacy and uh, how that's dynamic and contextual. And the last theme was about uh, increasing teacher leadership and teacher voice. And so really the, the overlap with, with this report uh, really honed in on the importance of, of leadership and school culture and those environments that are collaborative and collegial uh, and leadership that communicates and has a vision and is supportive of teachers. And the other key theme about professional development and, and much of what was said earlier, uh, self, uh, professional development that is often self-initiated is the most valuable uh, as opposed to mandated. Uh, self or professional development that is self-reflective um, is also critical, but also done in a collaborative fashion. Mm -hmm. And so there's that growth process that becomes a big part of uh, teachers' professional identities. And what's interesting is after 302 pages, uh, if you were to read this, uh, a lot of you would probably say, well, yeah, of course. Uh, it's, it's research that supports what we already know. And so the qualitative findings, coupled with the quantitative findings of, of this report, uh, really give so much more credence to teachers' perspectives and the need for 
uh, teacher voice uh, at the forefront of a lot of what we're doing. And I, I'll just end quickly with what is my title. Uh, the title is called This Is What I Am, uh, Teacher Professional Development, or sorry, Professional Identity, Motivation, Morale. And the interviewee who, who said that was, was pondering retirement. And she said, I, I don't, I don't, I'm scared of retiring. I don't ever want to get to a point where I can't say to somebody, uh, that I'm a teacher. She said, this is what I am. And I think with this report and with other uh, studies that point to the importance of teacher motivation, morale, uh, and this idea of supporting it and empowering teachers, uh, I think we can get to a point where many, many teachers, if not all teachers, can, can really say, this is what I am. And they're not defending the profession. They are uh, leading the profession and being a, a, a voice at the forefront of that. So thank you, Catherine. Thank you, David. We have time for some questions. There are two microphones on the floor. One is here, one is there. If you have a question, can you go to one of those microphones and ask it of the panel? Thank you so much for this opportunity to hear a lot of this. This is pretty amazing. I think we're all really pumped up about the word teacher leadership, but I think this is more of an observation than it is really a question, as we all are here just kind of taking everything in, because the word teacher leadership is very new, and we're glad to be the pioneers as long to, to bring that forth, and I thank you, Catherine, for always inspiring us in Arizona to really bring that forth with us. But that, I think, as we're talking about teachers and we're talking about all these things, what we don't have here are principles. And I think that that's an important thing because in Florida, um, one of the things is the definition itself of teacher effectiveness and how important it is for our principals to be on board to know exactly what that means in order to really bring forth what that is in their specific classes, as well as superintendents, to know what that definition means, professional development for principals so that it can actually happen in each classroom in each district. The also thing is um, the definition of teacher effectiveness. That also can be very subjective. And so it's important that we know what does it mean to be an effective teacher. Evaluations in Florida, the VAM, is something that has caused teaching morale to go down very much. And that's something we need to address. Is that really what defines a teacher? We as teachers know what it means to be an effective teacher. It's not necessarily just the scores, but it's truly Look at Sean McComb himself and what he's done and how he's inspired other people from the video we just saw on CBS. And so I think it's important that we need to have those definitions and the dialogues with the principals as well so that we can really all come together within our states to have this true definition. It took a long time for all of us to find the definition of rigor, and we had to have that all the time, and now we have to find other definitions, the specific, a solid definition for both. So we need that support for principals and professional development. How would you think as us, as, as teachers of the year, could bring forth this information to our principals to get this dialogue going is my first question. My second question is mentoring. I think it's genius. I think it's exactly what it should be. But once again, it comes down to teachers and the time. With Marzano, Danielson, evaluation, and a lot of things that are happening, Teachers are actually getting very affected with a, an overload of things, but they know they would love to mentor, but yet that time constraint is there as well. How can teachers be rewarded by doing such a rewarded thing, and I don't mean monetarily, in a way that they can affect and help and elevate other teachers through the mentor process, but still be an effective teacher in their own classroom with such a workload that they have to do? So that was the other questions, and as well as one more thing, sorry. A PhD to teach a graduate course isn't necessarily what I think is important. I've taught courses as well, and I think that experience as a teacher is really what should be a teaching graduate courses for teachers to become teachers. Our experiences ourselves are far more than a degree from someone who hasn't been in the classroom for 20 years, so thank you for teaching those courses that you did, and thank you for your PhD. Those are my questions. Okay. Does anyone on the panel want to tackle You're one welcome. of Darina's questions? Um, so, Darina, did you ask a question? I didn't get, I didn't get that there. So, I'll, I'll just say what I want to say. Um, the, um, um, for, I, I'll just leave it pretty simple. I, I've heard several 
Um, and not actually this week, but several times when I'm meeting with teachers, I get the phrase, I'm just a teacher. And it, I, I want to just come out of my skin. I, don't, I think how we talk about the profession is really important. And um, uh, none of you are just teachers. N there's not a single teacher out there who's doing great work with kids who are just teachers. You're changing kids' lives. I mean, it's, it's, it's so much more important to this country what we do in the classrooms than, uh, uh, than anything else I can think of. All the long-term trends about our economy, all the things we talk about, um, social justice, uh, uh, crime, all depend on what we do with these kids as they're growing up. So um, I guess I think the biggest thing I would stress is sort of a dialogue change here. And I, tr I work very hard to do that, and I want you to call me out if I'm not doing it, because um, it, it is such an important point that as you all step out in your states now, and you have been doing it since, since January, I know, but uh, as you're having those conversations, talking about the importance of every single one of us that are changing kids' lives, I think that dialogue change is, is understated. It's, it's more important than, um, than a lot of the stuff we can do. Because if we can change that, then we can change some of the policies related to it and stop treating class to do this. Um, so um, anyway, I, that, that's my reaction to what you said. Can, can I say one? Can I add yes. one quick, quick thing? I know we're, we're in a hurry. Um, so I do want to I do want to point on, like touch on one of the points that you made, and I think one of the reasons that we chose the the name from good to great is because we wanted to draw the conversation back to um, an idea around high functioning organizations, and successful organizations know that their most important asset is their people, and teaching is no different. Our most important asset are our teachers, and so I think we need to be bold and think about how can we restructure um, the environment in which people teach so that at the center of it is teacher learning. If we know teachers and, and leaders are the most important asset to the organization, um, particularly for student success, let's rethink what our school day looks like so that we can actually organize it around teacher learning. Because I think we hear that all, t all the time. We're always trying to cram collaboration into a day rather than planning the day around collaboration. So that's kind of my charge to you to, to be those kind of bold thinkers. How do we do that and how do we go forward? Thank you, Angela. Ellen? Um, just really quickly, in terms of how to spark those conversations that need to happen, we um, have developed a suite of materials that are designed just to do that, to spark conversations among teachers about policy. Is this on? It's on. Okay. Um, and I'm not going to tell you about it, but I'm going to just pull up the website. It's everyone at the table. Um, and I'd encourage you to investigate that. There's free resources for you there. We actually are currently looking for people to partner with um, to do some on the ground work around that too. So contact me if you'd be interested. It's a great resource. OK, last question. OK, um, Jay McMahon, 2014 Wisconsin Teacher of the Year. Uh, quick question. I, I love the coaching model that so many schools are adopting. Um, but I am really struggling with the fact that in these coaching models, a lot of really exemplary educators are being pulled from classrooms to do coaching. And I'm just curious, you know, is this something you're grappling with? Is this sort of a national? I mean, I'm seeing this certainly in our state as being um, a big trend. And I don't know really what the national picture is. And if you could just address that. Derek? I, I think the, 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 the question and the statement tie, tie together because um, you talked about mentoring, and everyone agrees that mentoring really works. The challenge is, just like um, um, collaboration work, how do you fit it in? And I think the coaching model has been one attempt to try to figure out how we can have excellent teachers mentoring uh, newer teachers, um, and yet without it st stressing that person out too much that they can't do either job effectively, being uh, in the classroom men teacher and mentoring, or being pulled out to to coach. So again, I think this becomes part of how you all fit into moving moving this forward. We we know what we know that our young teachers need this. We know that our experienced teachers grow from it. And so how do we make it happen? I will tell you that in St. Paul, one of your your fellow stories from Ryan Vernache's, I think 2011 from Minnesota, He's currently an instructional coach in St. In Paul. The St. Paul system has a phenomenal um, program. After two years in an instructional coach, you must go back to the classroom. Their philosophy is that you are going to provide experience. Yes, you won't be teaching, and there'll be some students that will lose from not having you as a teacher. But when you go back, you're going to be stronger. 
I'd also encourage you to look at some of the research base around differentiation of staffing. Molly Lasagna, I think it's the best name in the universe. Molly Lasagna is a researcher at AIR, and she has put together a terrific research paper on differentiated staffing. I call it the butterfly paper because it has a butterfly on the cover. It has a really long name, but I'll make sure that I get it to all of the 2014 State Teachers of the Year, Art Wise formerly of NCATE, has done a lot of work on differentiated staffing. There are some really good papers out there that propose innovative staffing models in which you would have multiple teachers at different stages of career teaching in the same classroom together with instead of one teacher 30 students, four teachers 100 students. And in that kind of a paradigm, you would have your coach and your folks being coached in the classroom at the same time. These are the kinds of out of the box solutions that we need to be looking at. Um, at this point, I can see that John Quam is standing outside and that the bus is there. And again, I do live in fear of John Quam. There's, there's not much that I fear, but I do fear John. Um, and so I am going to bring things to a close. And in doing that, I would like to acknowledge Michigan State Teacher of the Year 2014, Gary Abood, who has very graciously given us his time and talents this morning to record this session so that all of the partners can put it on their websites and you will all have access to it. I would also like to thank and acknowledge CCSSO again for hosting this event. And I would really like to call out, thank you CCSSO. <laughs> I'd really like to call out the six partner organizations, CCSSO, CAPE, formerly NCAPE, now CAPE, the NEA, NCTQ, the GTL Center at AIR, AACTE, who took a chance on a group of teachers and took us seriously and produced this study. And I'd also like most sincerely to thank our panelists for coming out on such a yucky day in DC. <laughs> Have a great rest of the day, of the afternoon. <laughs>